Yeah, welcome to a short introduction into testing against Corona. Yeah, testing against Corona, there are principal two type of tests, these antigen lateral flow tests and the PCR tests. And there is a lot of discussion around, is this a good test? Is the one better? Do I always need to do a PCR test? Does antigen testing make sense at all? And before we can respond to these questions, we first have to see how do these tests actually work? So the purpose of this video is explain really how these tests works. And we will discuss at the end, uh, what are um, the differences between these two tests and why both tests can be used. And finally, don't miss the tutorials vaccines against corona and what is the best strategy against the uh, corona so in other words what is the difference between an individual test result and the overall pandemics because that's what it's at the end all about okay so let's have a look how a lateral flow SARS-CoV test works yeah first of all we need the virus and uh, the virus comes at the end from the nose. So we extract the virus from the nose. Here it just drops up. <laughs> That's how we do it. So we here, here we have the virus. It's an enveloped virus as we see. And this virus is in the first step then lysed. So this buffer, this is a lysis buffer and it disrupts the envelope. And then we have the components of the corona virus. So here it's very simplified. We have just the spike protein, which is the outer protein, uh, which is separated then the capsid proteins and the RNA. For the corona antigen test itself, just the capsid protein is used in most tests. And uh, therefore we have the capsid protein. And what we need in addition is we need in addition certain antibodies. Antibodies are the ones what we induce for our vaccination. But in this case, these are special antibodies just used for testing. Usually these are so-called monoclonal antibodies, which just have one specificity and are just a one special antibody. So we have three different antibodies here. We have two antibodies which recognize the capsid protein and we have one antibody, which is just an antibody recognizing another antibody. So these are the three antibodies which are used in the kit and with everything with these antibodies, we can work. Now, the, as you see, the first antibody here is a red antibody. So this has a red dye. So of course, it's not the antibody itself is not red. It's just coupled to a dye, which makes it colored that you can see it at the end. So as you can see, of course, a capsid antibody can bind the capsid. But these two antibodies, this is the gray and the red antibody, recognize different regions of the capsid. So for this region, reason, you can not just bind the capsid, but the um, this gray anti-capsid antibody can bind the capsid plus the other, the red antibody bound. We will see later on why this is important. The other antibody just can bind antibodies. Now let's have a look how these antibodies and this capsid protein of the coronavirus react together in the assay. Okay, so this is how a typical assay looks like. So there are, of course, different formats, but in principle, you have a region where you put your drop of your um, sample, and then you can read this in this region CT. And if, if we would just open this test and look what's inside, then we see that in this initial region, we have this red antibody, which is the cap anti-capsid antibody. In the next region, at that T, where we have this positive signal, we have again an anti protein um, antibody. However, in this case, it's bound to the surface. And in the region C, we have this antibody which captures other antibodies. So this is how it's structured. And now if we close that again, and if we just load our sample with our virus, you see in this case, it's a positive sample. We have our capsid and we have our um, spike proteins there, but the relevant protein here is just the capsid protein. Then the liquid runs. So this is the principle of a lateral flow that you generate a liquid flow over this assay. So you see that it first comes into the region where we have this red antibody, which is a capsid antibody, and this capsid binds to this antibody. Now, this antibody 
and the capsid protein is transported further. And we have the sandwich binding of this capsid antibody with the capsid to the other antibody in the region T, so where our positive signal happens. Again, as explained before, because they bind different regions, these, two, these antibodies. Now, there are excess antibodies here, which have not no capsid bound. And of course, the um, spike proteins or the RNA is not bound because there is no specific antibody there. So it's further developed and the excess antibodies and the other material is washed away. The capsid antibody, which is bound to the capsid, of course, sticks at the region T. Now at the region C, the antibody binds, um, the excess antibody binds, and of course, the, the spike protein and the RNA and so on is transported further. So that's how this assay, the development of this assay works. You have to wait until all the color is washed away. And these are the two bands. So the red antibody, the red colored antibody bound at the region T gives this stripe at the region T, which is then a positive test because we have we need this capsid for that. And at the region C, it's just to control that you had enough liquid in this case. So this is how the basic um, assay works. And now, of course, you can read your assay and you see now this is positive. Now let's just compare how a negative and a positive assay look like. We have on both sides, we have the, our antigen test. Of course, the structure of the test is the same. And you see on the lower side, we load a sample which is positive, And then the upper side, we load a sample which is negative. So let's see what's happened. Of course, the lateral flow is the same. We have this flow in the same direction. But now at the region T, we only have a binding for, um, uh, in the case of the positive sample, because there the capsid is present. And this capsid antibody, therefore, which is bound at the region T, can bind the capsid and at the same time bind the colored antibody. This happens not in the negative sample. The fur it further proceeds. So in the negative sample and in the positive sample, of course, the excess antibody is bound to the region C. And the excess antibody or the proteins, uh, other proteins which are not specific, are washed away. So you, of course, also see that usually you run these tests with an excess antibody. So you have this red antibody in excess that you have enough for binding and this is washed away. Now, at the end, the same, it's developed. In the case of the negative assay, of course, you only have um, a signal at C. In the case of the positive, you have T and C. By the way, these are original tests. The upper test was my test um, and the lower test was the test of my daughter who had corona and was, of course, corona positive. Yeah, this is in principle how these tests works. So this is, uh, you see, it's very simple. You detect the antigen and that's it. What is important is you detect the capsid antigen. So the, uh, it's important because the capsid antigen is not so variable than the spike protein. So um, you will. why this is the case, uh, we will discuss that if we come to the vaccines. However, it's important to note this is the case. So um, for example, the um, Omicron variant has many, many mutations in the spike protein, but only very few, one or two mutation in the capsid protein. So therefore, if you try, if you use a test with a specificity against a capsid protein, the advantage is that you can use the same test for many variants. And this is what happens. So um, these tests, which I have shown you, were tests driven uh, positive against the Omicron variant. So they can readily detect the Omicron variant and most likely also future variants. If you would drive, if you would design a test against the spike protein, you would have to redesign it um, each time you have a new variant, which is quite <laughs> demanding. So, of course, this is um, it's not a good idea to use an antibody against the spike protein for testing purposes. For vaccines, it's different, of course. Um, but what you can do is, instead of using antibodies against the capsid, use antibodies against the human chorionic gonadotropin hormone. Um, one bound, one colored, 
soluble, and in this case, use a, um, a urine, and in this case, you have a pregnancy test. So this is how pregnancy tests work. So you see, you had, have learned two things at the same time here. Okay, now we know how uh, antigen test works. Now let's have a look how what is the principle behind PCR tests. Here we go. If we talk about PCR uh, tests, first of all, we need to know what is a PCR. And a PCR is also called polymerase chain reaction. And this was one, I don't want to say one of the most important, but let's say certainly one of the most important <laughs> discoveries in molecular biology. And you see, it's not just relevant for molecular biology, it's relevant for many, 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 many disciplines, including solid testing against corona. So, by the way, this is the inventor of um, this method, Kerry Mullis, and this is uh, what he loves to do most, surfing. Okay, before we talk about PCR, we should talk about how a cell can double DNA. This is called a process which is called DNA replication. And that's very simple. Um, we start with a double strand DNA. DNA is double stranded. Then these strands are separated and then these strands are amplified. And as you see here with this color codes, there are four different colors and two colors always match together. So you can really stick these colors together and these are different bases um, and we can use um, just letters for these bases A, C, T, G and A is always matching to T and C is always matching to G. Of course these are chemical bases and uh, uh, but however the, the ma matching on the molecular level really happens like this. So replication is simple. You own uh, the polymerase, the enzyme, just needs to look for what other molecule is fitting, and then it's just synthesizing the other strand. So you see, this is how you amplify um, DNA. Does this work in a test tube? So this was how it worked in a cell. And of course this works, otherwise you wouldn't have a PCR. You need just a couple of things. One thing you need is you need the enzyme. So the enzyme is in this case, of course, also called, which is that called, it's a DNA polymerase. Um, and what you also need are two short starter DNA fragments in order to start the DNA polymerization. Without this, um, the DNA polymerase cannot work. Now, the cool thing about this starter fragments is that you decide about the sequence. So you see that if you look at these starter fragments, they have a distinct, a certain sequence of bases. And you can choose these sequences as you want. So these are just 20, usually you use uh, primers with 20 bases. And if you want to design a corona test, just use um, sequences which are on your corona, which are specific for your coronaviruses. And then your PCR will amplify your DNA of your coronavirus. DNA in this case, we will talk about that in a second. So this, me this means that you only will have an amplification in your PCR if the, um, the DNA of the virus is present. Now this is if you do that once, and of course you shouldn't do that once, you should repeat that. So you do that once, um, you do that twice, and you do that another time, and you always double the amount of your DNA, which with each step. So the steps are very simple here. What you do is you need to take away these two um, DNA fragments, um, this you do by heating up to 94 degree. Then you put the primers on it. This happens by cooling down, depending on the primer, maybe 58 degrees. And then you have your polymerization reaction. This happens at 72 degrees. And this you repeat, 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 repeat for, for example, 40 cycles. So this is how a PCR works. Now, how does a corona PCR test work? And the first thing which is clear is you need to have your viral RNA. The isolation basically looks the same as in the case of our antigen test. You have a buffer, um, you have then an extraction buffer and so on, and you end up with your RNA. And the problem is with your RNA, you cannot do a PCR. You have to use DNA. So you have to translate these DNA, uh, these RNA first into 
DNA. And you see, if you look closely at this picture, there are some differences here. So there are some bases. There is one base which differs from RNA to DNA. Also, the backbone is, backbone is different, but this we don't care. But there is a slight difference. So DNA and RNA is not the same and different enzymes are using it. So this process uh, trans um, transcribing RNA into DNA is called reverse transcription. And this is a process which doesn't happen in our cells. We don't do that. We only produce RNA from DNA because the RNA is then used to produce proteins, not the way back. This is done by retroviruses, so therefore we have this enzyme. If there were no, were no, wouldn't be no retroviruses, we wouldn't have this reverse transcription possibility. However, the cell cannot do that. And this is important to note that this means that an RNA virus and an RNA vaccine cannot integrate into our DNA in our chromosomes, which is composed of DNA because we simply miss uh, the reverse transcription process. We don't have that. We cannot do that. So there is no, absolutely no risk at all of RNA integrating into our genomes. Full stop. If we don't have another virus particle around, which is a retrovirus, and this is what we don't use. So this, what you have seen here, it's a reverse transcription, which happens in the test tube. And there we can do these things. So we have the reverse transcription. And then we do a so-called real-time PCR. And the difference between a normal PCR and a real-time PCR is subtle. We, of course, also have the primers. And what we do is we amplify. We have these, these periods of amplification. And after each amplification, we measure how much DNA did we produce. And you see here, this DNA is... Um, is uh, fluores fluorescing, so we measure the light intensity, the fluorescence light intensity, and this is how this is at the end blotted. So this is the fluorescence intensity, and this is at the end how this is blotted, and uh, on the scale here, it's the, the cycle number, and here we have the intensity. Okay, so let's have a look how such a real-time PCR works in real, kind of. Okay, what we have here is kind of a real-time model of our real-time PCR. So it, at the end, what it simulates, it simulates just the um, cycles and the amount of DNA we have produced and the detection. Okay, now let's assume we start with a sample of uh, where we have 1,000 viruses isolated from our nose from our nose swab and we have now 1,000 viruses inside. So therefore we have 1,000 copies of the viral RNA, which then, of course, in the next step is um, translated into, trans reverse transcribed into DNA. We assume in this case that it's double strand, but it doesn't matter that it's not double strand. So you see we have 1,000 copies, and you see we have here the mass of these 1,000 copies DNA. We assume that we amplify a 100 base fragment, which is not the complete viral RNA, but which is very um, common for real-time PCRs that quite short fragments are amplified. And you see the mass you don't even see here. Uh, and this is the mass in microgram. Microgram means it's one gram divided by one million. So there is not much material inside. You don't even see with these many digits anything. So this is what we have loaded. Now let's start the PCR and what, let's see what's happened. So in the first step, again, do the nature. So you separate the DNA strands in the first cycle. And then after you have separated the strands, what you have to bring in, you bring in the primer. So we are still at this denature step. And now we have this so-called annealing step where the primers bind um, to the DNA. And this is done at lower temperatures, in this case at 58 degrees. And now we elongate. Now the DNA polymerase starts its action. Of course, you use DNA polymerases, which are heat resistant. Now, this elongation takes some time, and as soon as the first cycle is done, you start with a second cycle, and you see that now we are at 2,000 copy. By the way, this was real-time. This is how long a real PC, uh, test assay um, works, test cycle in a real-world um, corona assay works. Okay, here we go. Now, the next assays, we do a um, 
speed up a bit and you see we are at cycle 20 nothing happens and now at cycle 22 we see that there is enough mass to be dis detected and the ct value here is plotted and now you also see for what this what the ct value stands for ct value is cycle threshold this simply means that this is the value as soon as we have so many dna inside at at that point we can readily detect it by the way how this is detected this depends on the assay you can measure dna with dyes which can just measure double strand dnas but usually you use certain probes which are making the assay even more specific but this is just for detail at the end this is you detect that after each cycle so this means in this case with 1000 copies we have a cycle threshold of 22. i think at this point it's important to um, note the cycle it's not quantitative i will talk that at the end again so it's relative so if if everything works fine and everything would be optimal we could have a cycle threshold of 22 um, with 1,000 copies of viral RNA. The cycle threshold, of course, then depends on what the detection system is we use, whether we use simple dyes, whether we use um, uh, Techman probes. Um, it depends on um, our how good is the isolation, how good is the lysis, and so on. So there are many, many things involved. So therefore, we cannot say a cycle threshold of 22 is 1,000 copies. But in this system, as we have run it, if we would calibrate it, if we would use a reference, then we could do that. So, but however roundabout, uh, the, the cycle number, of course, correlates with the amount of virus we have in our initial sample. So let's just vary. So we have now 1,000. Now let's start with sample A is now one viral particle. Sample B is 1,000 viral particles, way more. And sample C is, let's say, 50,000 viral particles. And now we start um, the RT-PCR again, and we go with these higher numbers. Okay, now we speed it up in the first cycle we don't do in real time. We have seen it takes 45 seconds. What we have also seen, by the way, is um, we have used um, 58 degrees for binding and 72 degrees for elongation. This depends on the assay. Sometimes it's performed at 50, uh, 58 degrees throughout the complete assay. This doesn't matter. These are technical details. However, the time, it's around about 40, 45 seconds. The complete one cycle, 45 seconds. Um, okay, let's go back and let's start the real-time PCR again with our new parameters. Here we go. So you see the copy number goes up and we don't see anything yet at cycle six or seven uh, with respect to the mass. Now we start at sample C, which is the highest concentration, at least to see some microgram of DNA, a uh, fraction of microgram. And you see that we start with detecting it already at cycle 16. Now you see sample B starts the detection at 22. This is the sample we have used before. So this is the same as before. And sample one, uh, sample A, which is just one copy, you see that cycle uh, the cycle threshold here is 32. So we start the detection at 32. So the cool thing about real-time PCR or PCR is in principle, in theory, you can really detect one copy of your RNA or of your DNA, which is uh, reverse transcribed. Um, in practice, of course, there are many, many things that you cannot really detect one copy. However, it's very, very sensitive. And you see here that the uh, cycle threshold correlates, of course, the amount of RNA you have inside. So it's a semi-quantitative assay, at least if, during the same run, same operator, you can compare it. Of course, these masses here, uh, you will not have 170 micrograms of DNA in your test tube. This is just, at the end, the, um, uh, the reagents of in your test tubes are exhausted, then, of course, the, it doesn't increase anymore. So then you have here a plateau. I was just so lazy to program it that it's also um, there a plateau Maybe at the end you have at maximum two or three micrograms of DNA in analytical PCR, it's way less. Um, however, what you see is your 50,000 copies have a CT value of 16, your um, 1,000 copies have a CT value of 22, and your 
single copy, one single RNA molecule has a uh, CT value of 32. You see that this is a log scale there. Yeah? So it's always double, double, double. So the difference between 32 and 22 is there are 1,000 more molecules. So this is 10. It's 2 uh, to the power of 10 difference. And here we are just from 1,000 to 50,000, which is a real huge difference. And here we are 22 to 16. You see that these, uh, the lower the cycle thresholds are, the really higher the viral load is. So if you have cycle thresholds of 13, 12, or 11, you have enormously high viral loads. If you have cycle thresholds 20, 23, 24, 25, moderate viral loads and in, if the cycle thresholds are very high so here we are at 32 you maybe have one or two viruses so it's very low the viral load so this you can say it of course correlates but you can never say that you never can compare um, cycle thresholds from different assays that's important to note so i said it's not, not absolutely quantitative is there a way uh, to make a PCR really quantitative, completely quantitative, either you can calibrate or you can use this machine. This is a real quantitative PCR. This is a so-called digital droplet PCR. The drawback of this PCR is um, you can compare it with a Ferrari because it costs around about the same. Um, we have this, um, I have this digital droplet PCR in the in the lab because there are certain advantages of this uh, this equipment. Um, however, this is of course not used for routine diagnostics. Now, back to the question. So um, we have now two different assays. We have the antigen assay and we have the RT-PCR assay and both works well. Now the question is, what are, are the advantages? What are the drawbacks? You remember many people say, ah, this antigen assay um, doesn't work properly because I had a positive signal with a PCR um, assay, but not with the antigen assay. So it's of course clear that an antigen assay, there is a different detection limit. There is no amplification. So you just see one antibody binds to one capsid protein. So this means that to see it with your eyes, you have, to have, you have to have a certain amount of virus in order to see a positive signal. So this assay cannot be as sensitive as an RT-PCR assay. So this means you could have a positive RT-PCR assay and at the same time a negative antigen assay. This happens. By the way, these CT values you see you've seen before were 16, 22, and um, I think 32. This is kind of the CT values of my family, more or less. So my daughter arrived last week when I'm doing this video. This was a week ago. I, I kept uh, catch her up with a CT value of 16, highly infected, high virus load. My son had the infection before, a separately infected CT value of 23. And you have seen that also if you compare that um, the CT value of the PCR test with your antigen test, you could see the difference right away. And my wife now also is infected with a CT value of 26. And also there, the signal in the antigen test is lower. So it correlates kind of. It's not um, a one-to-one -one thing. You cannot say 26 is 1,000 viruses. But this is, of course, a correlation. Okay, so again, very low CT values are very high viral load. Very high viral um, CT values are low viral load. And we have said that if you have very low um, C, um, viral loads, that this can might be detected by RT-PCR, but might not be detected by your antigen test. So is it not worth it, this antigen test? This is then the question. And the response is, of course it is. Because the point is, one thing is being able to detect one virus. The other thing is, what does that mean? So what you want in the antigen testing, and this is what we will discuss in this um, strategy and uh, the overall politics around um, corona testing vaccines and so on, how this all integrates. What you want at the end is, uh, first of all, you want to um, see, is this person infected? This You don't treat in general against corona. So if you're at home and if you're infected, at the end, you don't care whether you have a bad cold, flu, or corona, 
Because what you do is you treat the symptoms and this is always the same. So there is no need to for you to know whether you have corona or something else. Um, if you're in the hospital, things get different, but at home, it doesn't matter. So for this being at home, the relevance of the antigen of the testing is protect others because if you are infected with corona, you should stay at home. So this is why you test. And if um, you, you have to stay at home if you're infective. And of course, if you just have one virus, the question is, are you really infective? So, and this is what we want to look at now. So let's have a look at how to visualize, whether we can visualize how these infection scenarios could look like. So here we go. Okay, you might remember in our antigen test there, our virus particle dropped out the nose. So of course we had a swap where we uh, took it out for our testing. But of course, that's the way how it comes out. But it's not coming out as such, it's coming out in a small drop of liquid. And if this liquid is very, very small, it can stay in the air for a long time. And this is then called an aerosol. So we have a drop, a small drop of liquid around this viral particle. And of course, depending on our viral load, there might be viral particles coming out, which there are aerosol particles coming out of our nose which are carrying viruses and others which are not carrying viruses and of course this depends on the load. Now this is the basics. Now how do we get infected? Now we just put this nose into one room and another nose of an uninfected person in the same room. So um, then of course the person who is infected will release um, continuously particles or aerosol particles which might carry the virus. Of course, this is just a visualization. This is not a modeling, but um, intuitively you will see where the problem is if you run around with CT values of 34 and say, I have to um, uh, stay at home. Now, let's see what's happened in a scenario where we have a low uh, viral load. So in such a scenario, things will look like this. So we will have, of course, the release of aerosol particles, and sometimes there will also be a, a particle which is um, carrying a virus, but there will be many particles uh, who have no virus inside or who have very, very low quantities of viruses inside. Again, this is not um, an absolute model, but you can do that. You can model that. This means that the likelihood, as you have seen here, now you're 10 minutes in the same room. Um, there are usually also persons around these noses. You're 10 minutes in the same room. And you have seen in this scenario, um, you don't take up uh, the infected particle because it, the likelihood was too low. Of course, this can happen if you do that 1,000 times. There will be cases where you get this infected particle, but the likelihood is low. Now, what happens if you have a medium um, um, infectivity, so medium concentration? You see that also here uh, particles are inhaled, and you see that now also an infective particle is inhaled, and this means in this situation we have an infection. Usually, if we talk about infection, we also say that synonymously to disease. In infection biology, infection just means that the, the virus has entered the body, full stop. If you get one virus particle, whether this is enough for developing disease, that's of course a, a question. Now, if we come to the scenario where we have a high infectivity, so virtually all um, aerosol particles coming out of your nose or of your respiratory system carry viruses, you will quite soon get um, an aerosol particle which has the virus and you will get many of them. So you see the time until infection in this case was four minutes and you have five infective particles inhaled in contrast to the medium scenario where it took nine minutes, it took longer, and you had just one particle inhaled. So in other words, um, a very important conclusion here is if you are in a room with an infected person, it depends on how is the viral load. If the viral load is extremely low, the likelihood that you get the infection is also 
low. If the if it's medium, then it depends on the time and the distance. If you're farther away, then of course the likelihood that you get the infection is lower because the concentration of the aerosol around the person who will uh, breathe out these aerosols will be higher, both the infected and non-infected um, uh, liquid particles. However, of course, it's really increasing so then um, if it's a medium that th there is a certain likelihood that you get infected and there is a certain likelihood that you get enough virus um, inside to develop the disease and if you have a highly infective person which means it has a very high load of viral particles this person can infect you without additional measures in a closed room without a large distance within minutes. This is how it is. How can you protect yourself? Yeah. Stay with your mask. A mask will reduce the uh, infection risk. FFP2 mask will into, uh, reduce the infection risk to zero like, uh, virtually. So this means from a, from a infection biology point of view, epidemiological point of view, the persons who you need to separate are the persons with a high viral load because they can infect quickly others even if the contact time is very short and these people are always identified with the antigen lateral flow tests so the sensitivity of the lateral flow tests is not so high but the precision to detect these highly infected people is very high and this is the important thing. And therefore, these antigen tests are very helpful because they're so easy to use. You can use them at home. You cannot do an RT-PCR at home, but you can use, everyone can use it. So it's easy to make a broad testing. And that was the strategy here. We will discuss about that later on. Yeah, so that's about how the test works, why both tests are important and have their pros and cons. And um, stay and also look at the video how the scenes works and the overall discussion about the strategy. Thanks for your attention. Goodbye.